Hi, my name is Tom Rawls and I'm the pastor here at Proclaimers and I'd like to welcome you to our YouTube channel. Sunday by Sunday we take uh, great delight in, in sharing what the Bible has to say. The Bible, probably one of the most relevant books in the entire world, with principles that touch every area of our lives. One of the key ingredients to the life of our church and its preaching is the variety of those who actually get up and speak from myself with over 40 years of experience, Dr. Phil Temple, who is a psychiatrist, doctor, medical doctor, again, with 15 years of experience at preaching. We've just had such a phenomenal blessing by having so many great speakers. We hope you enjoy this particular YouTube video of our latest uh, ministry here at Proclaimers. So thank you again for joining us and God bless you. Do you know what? I am going to sneak along on Friday night. I'm going to come too. I'm going to pretend that I've got an alumni card. I went to UEA. I'm going to be there. Because I've got to tell you, Mal Fletcher is a once-in-a-generation, one-of-a-kind voice. He really is. Uh, we don't get in just any old speaker. I, I know I should start my own message, but I just got to encourage you to come back. Do you know, even if you're not someone that's normally found in church, Mal Fletcher thinks on a level that most people don't think of, has an understanding of what's going on in culture and what's coming next in society that most of us have no idea of, and is so articulate in the way that he speaks that for me, watching him as a communicator, he fits about 15 messages into one message. So I just want to encourage you. I was talking down in Ipswich this morning, and I was saying, you know, that they need to be there to hear from him. I want to encourage you to come along and hear from Mal next Sunday morning, whether you normally join us in church or not. I know it's unusual if you don't to come two Sundays in a row, but I just wholeheartedly encourage you to be here from Mal. If you're a student, don't miss this. Of all of the things that we could do with Mal Fletcher, we're doing this thing on Friday night because we want to invest in you as the next generation. In fact, we don't think that you're in the next generation. We think you're the now generation. We think that if you're aged 18 to 20-something, you are perfectly placed to embrace and drive the future, not just of our city, but of our nation and around the world. And we want to do everything we can to invest in you. So I wholeheartedly encourage you to make sure you're there Friday night. It's in the Julian Study Center, 7.30. We're going to have a panel Q&A, all sorts of great stuff as well. But be there. If you can get like anywhere near the age range, sneak in as well. But also be here on Sunday to hear from Mal. Is that all right? None of which is in my notes, so I'm going to need to speak fast. Tonight, because I mentioned, I mentioned that I was a, have an alumni card because I went to UEA. Have we got any UEA students in the house tonight? Have we got any newer students in the house tonight? Have we got any students of anywhere else in? Hertfordshire. Turns out they've got a university and everything. <laughs> so I remember my first day of university. I remember how full of excitement I was. For some of you, this might be fairly recent. For me, this was about 15 years ago. No, it was longer than that, wasn't it? Let's not. Let's not even think about how long it is. I've almost lived in Norwich. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So I remember the excitement that I turned up to university with. I remember that I was just, I was so excited. I was excited about all of it. I was excited about the prospect of starting a new degree. I was excited for all of the possibilities that medical school would open up. I was excited about meeting new flatmates, about making new friends. And I was kind of nervous too, because I, despite what it might look like, I'm not naturally an outgoing person. So I was kind of feeling kind of shy, but kind of excited about the adventure that was ahead of me. Um, and I, when I got to my new flat, I quickly found that things had not gone in the direction that I hoped that they would. Because one of the things that the university did with medical students is they put them in flats with other medical students and with allied health professionals and with postgraduate students because we all have to stay later into the summer. Ah, uh, not enough sympathy, but never mind. So... So I turned up and what I found was, I found that they'd forgotten the other medical students in my flat. And they'd forgotten the allied health professionals too. I found that I was in a flat with seven postgraduates, all but one of whom were international students, all of whom had arrived earlier than me, and all of whom were old hat at this whole university experience. This was not what I was expecting. They were definitely not at the same stage of life that I was. And instead of the friendly, sociable atmosphere I was expecting, I found a flat full of people who were settled in, focused on studying, and much, much older than I was. Well, they seemed much older then. Now, basically the same age. But as I moved my stuff in, I was hit with the sudden realization that all was not 
the way I had hoped it would be, that this was not what I expected. This was not part of the plan. You know, I was meant to meet new people, people like me, fellow medics, other people that were fresh out of school, moving away from home for the first time, not these jaded academics, more inclined to study than to hit the LCR. I was so, so disappointed. I remember my eating my dinner very slowly that night, anxiety occupying all the space in my stomach. And it maybe seems trivial looking back on it, but it hit me so hard then that it was not the way it was meant to be. As some of you might be aware, we're, aware, we're partway through a series of messages here. We're partway through a series that we've called Fatal Distractions. We're, and distractions, as Pastor Tom defined them at the start of this series, are something that diverts your attention from its rightful focus or anything that entices you to shift your focus from a meaningful venture. But we're not just talking about distractions. Hey, we all have distractions in life, right? Those notifications that pop up on our phone, the, the things that we would rather do, the BuzzFeed quiz that we do instead of studying. We all have distractions in life. But not all distractions are fatal distractions. We're talking about the kind of distractions that can hurt you, the kind of distractions that derail your hopes and dreams, the kind of distractions that negatively impact the course of your life. And last Sunday morning, Sam spoke brilliantly about the danger of being distracted by disappointment. If you didn't hear it, you should head to our YouTube and check it out. But I wanted to return to this topic this evening because I feel like there is more to say about this. And I'm conscious that disappointment, like distraction, is an experience common to us all. Let's have a show of hands, shall we? Who's ever been disappointed at any point in their life? Put your hand up. Not, I mean, if you, only if you've been disappointed. Who's been disappointed this year? Who's been disappointed this month? Keep your hand up. Who's been disappointed this week? Who's been disappointed today? Some of you are like, yeah, when I found out who was speaking. Anyway. <laughs> Do you know, disappointment is an experience that is common to all of us. It's an experience that we face in all walks of life. We face disappointment in our day-to-day -day experiences at work, in our studies, in our relationships. But it stalks us too when it comes to the bigger things in life. When our bigger plans, our bigger dreams don't go the way we expect, disappointment is so often what we feel. I was reading a book recently called Learning to Speak God from Scratch by Jonathan Merritt. And he had a whole chapter devoted to disappointment. And he quoted an article from New York Magazine which stated that the feeling of being let down is actually one of life's toughest emotional experiences. And it went on to describe the neurochemical impact of disappointment. You see, disappointment is linked to your level of dopamine. Dopamine is the brain's pleasure chemical. It is released when we have positive life experiences. But the dopamine system in your brain does not just respond to what you experience, it also reacts to what you expect. So before something even happens, your dopamine levels start to rise in response to your expectation. You get this rush of anticipation. We probably all know what that's like, right? And then when that good thing happens, you get a, a second wave, a double shot of dopamine, if you like. But what happens if what you expect doesn't happen? Well, your dopamine levels drop, but they don't drop from the baseline level. They drop from the heightened level of your expectation. So you get a double dip of dopaminergic disappointment. It's something that researchers call a reward prediction error. This crash from what you expect to what you experience, and it hurts. As the author of that magazine put it, article put it, losing hurts even worse when it's not what you were expecting. So disappointment hits us hard. On a physiological level, it knocks us back. It knocks us back harder than we might realize at first. But there is another danger that stalks us on the other side of disappointment, one that is more insidious, more pernicious, and dare I say it, even more harmful. And that is disillusionment. To show you what I mean, I want to look at a biblical example, one that Jonathan Merritt describes as a portrait of what a reward prediction error looks like en masse. And this account is found in each of the four Gospels, but we're going to read it from Matthew chapter 21. 
And let me just say before we do that, even if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian tonight, even if you've been dragged along this evening, you've come along for baptisms, or you just somehow found yourself in this place, and you're not really sure what you believe, come with us on the journey tonight, because there is something that we can all learn from this. To set the scene, Jesus' earthly ministry is well underway by the point that we read about here. In fact, it's drawing to a close. Jesus has been traveling far and wide, teaching people, healing the sick, and stirring up a bit of trouble along the way. The religious leaders have started to plot against Jesus. They want to have him put to death. And so Jesus, his time on earth drawing to a close, heads for the center of the Jewish world for Jerusalem. But how he gets into Jerusalem is kind of interesting. It says, as they approached Jerusalem... And came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with a colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples did as Jesus had instructed. They brought the donkey and the colt and they placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. It says a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. Who is this? The crowd answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, Nazareth in Galilee. So here comes Jesus, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, people throwing off their jackets and chucking palm branches in front of him. I don't know what it is about reading this, but it reminds me of a scene from Aladdin. I don't know if you know the one I mean, the Prince Ali one. We've got a clip of it in case you don't know. Have we got this? We should probably leave it there. Or you'll all walk out singing, Prince Ali, glorious he, Ali Abba. Can we just face facts? Like the animated version's better. Let's just have it out loud. But anyway, Jesus comes. And I, I just wanted to show that clip because it gives you a sense of what's going on here. You know, Jesus might not have elephants. He might not have dancing girls. He might not have soldiers paving the way. He might not have Will Smith just about holding the tune in front of him. got to speak truth up here. We've got to speak truth. Yeah, Will Smith, in fairness, has had a slightly more re successful recording career than I have. So, Will, if you're watching, apologies. I'm a big fan. Anyway, <laughs> Jesus comes. And there is this same sense of commotion that we see in that video. That same sense of excitement. This same sense of anticipation. And Jesus doesn't have dancers or soldiers or an elephant. But he does have this same groundswell of excitement. Because Jesus... Jesus is a pretty impressive guy. Jesus is a guy who can walk on water. Jesus is the guy who can calm the storm, heal the sick. Just before this, he had raised a man from the dead. I mean, that is next level stuff. And many were starting to believe in Jesus. They were starting to believe that Jesus wasn't just another prophet or teacher, but that he was the Messiah. You know, the Jews had long hoped for this individual sent by God who would save them. Because the Jews had a long history of oppression and occupation. And at this point, they were occupied by the Romans. But they also had a long history of deliverance, of all the times that God had come through on their behalf. And they were expecting that God would send a Messiah to right the wrongs of their past, to sweep away injustice and put their enemies to the sword. And they thought that Jesus might be that guy. You know, if sickness bowed to him and demons ran from him and the wind obeyed him and he could even raise a man from the dead, then why couldn't he save their broken land? For Jews looking for a savior, this passage is rich with symbolism. Like the donkey, Jesus comes riding on a donkey, fulfilling the words of the prophet Zechariah. See your daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. 
The palm branches, too, were rich with meaning. They hark back to another Judas, Jewish hero, Judas Maccabeus, a freedom fighter who had entered Jerusalem 200 years earlier. And as Judas had approached the city, people then had waved palm branches and sung hymns. And when Judas arrived, he defeated the Syrian army, recaptured the temple, drove out their enemies, and reigned for a century until the Romans turned up. So the Jews that greeted Jesus had in mind a mighty warrior. Here he was, the miracle-working man of God. Surely this was the king foretold by Zechariah. Surely he was the freedom fighter arriving triumphantly like Judas Maccabeus. Surely he was here to defeat their enemies, to drive away their, the Romans, to make their city, their nation, theirs again. The anticipation was palpable. They shout to him, Hosanna, which means save us or even save us now. And the whole city is shaken. It says they were stirred. And that word stirred comes from the same Greek root that we get our word seismic. The city trembled as Jesus approached. But within a week, it all looked so different. The religious leaders had had enough of Jesus by this point. He was too dangerous to be left alive, so they paid one of his followers to betray him, had him seized and tried overnight, found guilty of blasphemy, and handed over to the Romans to be put to death. Again, each gospel carries an account of this encounter, but let's read from Mark. It says, Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of? But Jesus made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now, it was the custom at the festival to release one prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing that it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews, Pilate asked. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted, crucify him, all the louder. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them, and he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. This is a spectacular turn of events. Jesus goes from hero to hated in all of seven days. The same people who waved palm branches before him a week earlier, now baying for his blood. But can you blame them? This was meant to be their great hope, their Messiah, the one that God had sent to save them. But he had been found guilty of blasphemy by their priests, so how could he be a godly man? And how could he save them from the Romans if he was now a Roman captive. Even worse, Jesus hadn't even put up a fight. He made no reply to the accusations against him. He offered nothing in his defense. This is a reward prediction error in full effect. The crash of dopamine from the high of the soon coming king to the reality of another failed rebel rabbi languishing in Roman chains. They weren't just disappointed, they were disillusioned. Disillusionment is a feeling of disappointment resulting from the discovery that something is not as good as one believed it to be. It is defined by some as akin to depression, as a realization of unpleasant truth caused by the failure of that in what, which you once believed. Disillusionment is disappointment on steroids. It is disappointment with the volume turned up to 11. It is not just a passing moment. It is a state of mind that reshapes the way you see the world. And if I can give my own definition, disillusionment is the chronic form of disappointment. It is what happens when disappointment takes hold, when you see the world through the lens of what went wrong. It is the place that you can only get to through failed expectation, when you believe that something would turn out a certain way, but it didn't. And when the dust settles, you're not just disappointed. You find that you no longer even believe. The crowd are not just disappointed, they're disillusioned. They believed in Jesus, but in their eyes, he has failed them. They give up on him, give him over to the Romans, and they cry out for Barabbas. 
Barabbas, it tells us, was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. So Barabbas was a rebel too. He was a revolutionary. He tried to overthrow the Romans without success. But unlike silent Jesus, at least Barabbas was a fighter. Yeah, he may have been a murderer, but at least he put up a fight. You can see here a sense of what Jesus had really wanted, of what the Jews, sorry, had really wanted in how they call for Barabbas. They expected a fighter, a warrior, and Jesus wasn't one. And when they didn't get what they expected, they went back to the last guy to give it a go, to the man with blood on his hands, but at least he had fought, even if he lost. And it's easy to be critical of the crowd here, but how often has disappointment caused us to do the same? How often has disappointment caused us to give up on what we hope for and go back to what we know? Perhaps many of us know people who have done this in the most literal of ways, who go back to unhealthy relationships or who return to a dead-end job when striking out alone or finding something new didn't quite work out. But while that may apply to only some of us, most of us will have an experience of going back, back to old ways, back to old habits, back to old patterns. Haven't most of us at some point tried something new only to go back to the old when it didn't quite work out? And even though we, like the crowd that day, know that it is harmful, know that it's dysfunctional, the times that we try and fail somehow drive us back to what we used to do or think. Perhaps we don't go back because of disappointment. Perhaps we just give up. What shall I do then, Pilate asked, with the one that you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him, they say. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, you can put him to death. How often is this our experience when disappointment hits? When we have an expectation of something, a distinct hope, a dream, an idea, whatever it may be, but it doesn't quite work out. How often do we give up on it? How often do we put it to death in our thinking? There are many things like this that we may have given up on. Perhaps we had aspirations for our career, but we didn't get the promotion we wanted, so we stopped trying. Perhaps we had high hopes for a relationship, like the idea that we may get married one day, but it didn't quite work out with so-and-so, so now we don't try anymore. Maybe we had this grand idea that we couldn't quite get off the ground, and instead of striking out with our own business, we stay in our dead-end job. I know the feeling. I dreamed once of being a consultant, but some exams got in the way. And I think if I'm being really honest, that I let that dream die. Oh, that dream, that hope, that aspiration... Yeah, I put that to death. Perhaps it isn't any of those things that you've given up on. Perhaps you've given up on God. For some, perhaps that's been entirely. You once believed in God, even wholeheartedly, but you experienced disappointment and you've entirely given up on Him. For others, it may be more subtle but no less damaging. You once believed that God would use you. Believe that God had a plan for you. Believe that you had a part to play, but something went wrong disappointment hits somehow, some way, and now you've given up. You no longer pursue him with the same passion. No longer believe that there's a place for you in his story. No longer believe that you can make a difference. Maybe I'm framing this the wrong way. Maybe you don't feel like you've given up on God. Maybe you feel like God has given up on you. I didn't think I'd get a chance to talk about this as part of this series. I thought I only had one message, but here I am again. What we have to talk about today, I think, is so, so crucial because we all face disappointment. And if we're not careful, it can so easily get embedded in our experience. Enough disappointment, even often enough or big enough, can entirely shift our worldview, can knock our expectation off its axis, can tip us over into disillusionment from where we once had hope to where we no longer do. From where we once had ideas and aspirations to where we are just getting by. Because it's painful, isn't it? Disappointment. So we avoid it. We settle. We limit ourselves. We tell ourselves not to get so excited in the future. It won't work out. We won't get what we hope for. It'll fall down in the end. That's disillusionment. The chronic consequence of disappointment. When the reward prediction error has set the tone of our lives. And it fits with this series, not only because it is a distraction, 
but because it leads to more distraction. Disillusionment provides fertile soil for distraction. You know, we think perhaps that distraction comes at us all the time, but actually we go looking for it so often. We seek out distraction to take our mind off other things. And this is what happens when we are disillusioned. We look for other things to fill the gap once filled by expectation. We want to be distracted because it is better than being let down again. There are many other ways in which we distract ourselves, in which we intentionally fill our lives with white noise to avoid the sound of disillusionment that echoes within. Even in a moment like this, there are some people on their phones scrolling through social media because it's better to watch somebody else's life than be offered expectation in the message again. I've seen this in a church context. Forgive me for a moment if I speak to the Christians, but we are susceptible to what Pastor Tom would call noble distractions. Distractions which seem good, but are the, not the best thing that we could pursue. They are noble in that they seem to have some value, but ultimately they take us away from our primary focus. What is that primary focus? To seek and to save those who are lost. To reach out to our world with the message of Jesus. To, to let people know that they are loved by God. That he values them, cares for them, has purpose and meaning for their lives. The primary vehicle for that message is the local church. It is this community that is ordained by God as the way that he would reach out to his world. But perhaps we have gone seeking after other things. Things that have some value but are not as vital as the part we play here. Oh, but my charity work is so important. Oh, but it's important that I exercise because, you know, God gave me this body and I need to look after it. Oh, it's important that I put all of my time and effort into my job because, you know, whatever your hand finds to do, you've got to work at it with all you are. Oh, I know the organization isn't, I'm involved in isn't a church, but it's doing what the church would do. If you have lost a little passion, a little motivation, if you do not attend as much, serve as much, give as much, or engage quite the same, could it be that you are disillusioned? Because if I'm brutally, dangerously honest, I could understand it if you were. I've been part of this church for 15 years. And when I first signed up, our vision is the same as it is now, the salvation of our city. Where did I think we'd be? By this point, thousands, maybe more, thousands of people gathering, but we're not. We've grown. We've seen so much success. But have we seen as much success as 20-year-old Phil Temple expected? Honestly, no. And I know that there are a hundred reasons why not. If it was easy to build a big church, everybody would be doing it. But even though I know, do I still struggle with disappointment? Certainly. Have I wrestled with disillusionment? Undoubtedly. Have I been tempted to throw in the towel more times than you will ever know? So I get it, but I refuse. I refuse to let disillusionment get the better of me because I don't want to be the voice in the crowd that cries out, free Barabbas. I don't want to go back to the old days. I don't want yesterday's revolutionary. I don't want his civil unrest on the streets of my soul. I choose instead to press on towards the vision. Because while what I know may be safe and comfortable, it is also limited and limiting. And what waits within the future is far better than what we see today. This is the reality of Jesus' trial. The crowd turned on Jesus because they thought that he was doing less than they expected. But actually, he was gearing up to do much more. Because Jesus could have vanquished the Romans, but that would have left the crowd and us with an even greater problem. Sin. He would have left us to face our ultimate enemy, death, all on our own. Because each of us has fallen short of God's standard. Each of us has stumbled or slipped or missed the mark along the way. And our missteps and mistakes, the stuff the Bible calls sin, should separate us from God. Yet Jesus was prepared to give his life so that all of our mess, 
All of our junk should be cleared away. Jesus faces down a greater foe for a greater good. He does not fight or argue because he intends to give his life in our place so that we can be restored to right relationship with God. The people in the crowd that day missed it, in part because they had such a limited understanding of what God was going to do. Their image of the Messiah was much better served by a fighter like Barabbas than by Jesus. For disillusionment, we need an illusion. We need a false idea of what God is going to do. As the band comes, it strikes me that the mistake that they made was they had an idea of how God was work, would work, but they forgot about who he was. That verse that, that is found in Zechariah that talks of the, the king that would ride into Jerusalem, the next verse says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. But Jesus was not a freedom fighter. He was a peacemaker. He came to bring peace, not in a political sense, one that is won by war, but a peace in men's hearts when they are made right with God. If only they had sung the whole psalm that includes the words, Hosanna. If only they had started and ended, because that is Psalm 118. And Psalm 118 begins and ends with, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. And in the middle of that psalm, it is all about the challenges that they face and the challenges that they will overcome. But it doesn't start and end with what God does. It starts with who He is. That He is good and His love endures forever. And here's the problem. God doesn't move how we expect him to move. We have an idea because we're focused on how God will move. And we get disillusioned because he doesn't work the way that we expect. And there's nothing wrong with praising God for what he's done in the past. And there's nothing wrong, certainly, with expecting God to do great things in the future. The problem comes when we get too fixated on how he will work instead of who he is. If I could encourage you in one thing, one way that we can avoid disillusionment, it is to get to know who God is. To focus on who instead of how we will expect him to work. So we should expect great things, but we should expect great things because we have a great God. We should expect God to work on our behalf, not in a certain way, but because God loves us, because he is good and his love endures forever. If you've ever faced disappointment, if you've ever faced disillusionment, can I encourage you to go back to who God is, to Jesus who loves you, who values you, who welcomes you with open arms. I encourage you to go back to the Bible. If only they had known a few more verses from their ancient text, they would have known what kind of Messiah they were expecting. That's what's so powerful about these opportunities that we have to gather together because when we lift our voices in song, we remind ourselves of who God is. That He's the same in the valleys as on the mountains, and that He is with us all the same. And if you've ever faced a valley experience, if you will focus on who God is, you will find that Jesus is there in the midst of the darkness and in the midst of the, dark, the shadows even more powerfully than He is on the mountaintop. I mean, it isn't about the path that we expect to take. It's about who does the journey alongside us. It is about Jesus working in our lives. And maybe today you don't know Jesus at all. Maybe you once knew him and have disconnected from him. In a moment, we're going to hear the stories of the people who are being baptized this evening. I'm going to hear the difference that God has made in their lives. 
And after we have heard those stories, we will give you an opportunity to connect with Jesus for yourself. And I won't talk a lot about that moment, but I will say this. Nothing that you have ever done, nor will ever do, can separate you from God because of who Jesus is and what he has already done. As I finish, disillusionment is a heavy burden and a costly course. It weighs us down, but it leads nowhere. We find no enduring meaning, no relief, no life, no energy. And imagine if we could cast off the weight of disappointment, be freed from disillusionment, to hope and dream and believe again. Imagine too what our example might do in our city. If our friends, our family, our colleagues, do you know they're so often caught up in the same cycle of disappointment and disillusionment. They've looked for many ways to find meaning, many ways to find value, to find love, to find purpose. Perhaps they need to see in us a new example of a life lived differently, of a hope that grows and endures. So let us indulge our disillusionment no longer. Let us shake off disappointment when it comes. Let's not focus on how God works so much as who he is. Because when we truly know him, it will change us and it will change our world. Would you stand with me tonight? I want to pray for you. For anyone that has ever felt disappointed. For those of you who feel held down by disillusionment. As I've been speaking, you know that this is speaking right into your heart. I'm going to pray. And we're going to sing together. And as we sing, make that your prayer. Step in again to expectation. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you didn't come as a warmonger or a freedom fighter, but that you came as a peacemaker. And I pray that you would speak peace into people's hearts today. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that our relationship with you is not about how you will move in the future, but is based on who you are and what you have already done. I pray right now for every person weighed down by disillusionment or disappointment, that you would lift the weight off their shoulders and speak hope into their hearts again. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you for joining us uh, for this YouTube video presentation of our latest ministry. We hope you really enjoyed it. And if you did, why don't you subscribe to our channel? Better still, send us some feedback. If you have questions, let us know. We'd be more than happy to interact and engage with you. Thank you again, and we hope that you will join us soon. Why not try and make it to one of our services one Sunday? We're meeting here in Norwich from 10.30 a.m. and then again at 5 p.m. at night. We'd love to see you. God bless you.